There's no other endeavor where mind, body, and spirit are, are linked so closely, and it can have such an, a profound impact when you touch on all three of those arenas. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. It is time for episode 204. We're going to hear from sports psychologist turned taekwondo practitioner, Dr. Peter Peering. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear. Here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times each week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring and Apparel. I want to thank everybody that's come back to listen to my voice and the voice of our guests again and for anybody that might be new out there, thanks for checking us out for the first time. Do you ever clash shins with a sparring partner? Bone bruises are some of the worst injuries a martial artist can face, and even most of the shin guards on the market don't fully protect against shin clashes. Wilson we'll kick shin guards are made differently, though. They're double thick, but only over the tibia, your shin bone. The rest of the shin guard is well ventilated, and the whole thing is shaped to fit your shins on day one, so they're comfortable and they stay in place. They're easy to clean, they can fit under or over your training or competition attire. We've thought about everything with these things. They're great. Check them out, grab a pair at whistlekick.com. Today's guest has a story that will resonate for many of us, especially those who started martial arts as an adult. Dr. Peter Peering discovered martial arts could not only bring his family closer together, it allowed him to rediscover the joy he had as a competitive athlete in his earlier years. As a sports psychologist, He's learned how each of the two sides of his life not only bring value to the other, but to his clients. Help me welcome him to the show. Dr. Peering, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. It's, it's going to be a great time. We're going to talk about some good stuff, and I'm not even going to let the audience in on what we're going to talk about. We're just going to let it happen organically. We start in a pretty t traditional way because this is a traditional martial arts podcast. We want to know about your training and how you got started. So let's roll back to the beginning of your martial arts origin story and tell us how you first became a martial artist. Sure. We, we won't have to roll back too far. I'm fairly new to the martial arts. I'm 46 years old now, and I, I think I started when I was 41, almost 42 years old. I started training at uh, J.K. Lee Black Belt Academy. It's located outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin, started by Grandmaster Lee about 40 years ago. His son, Master Chan Lee, expanded on the school, and now there's six locations. I have done most of my, or all of my training with Mr. Jin Lee, a fourth degree black belt, and I initially started with Mrs. Sarah Stazak as well, but she was so good at what she did, she went off and started another branch of J.K. Lee Black Belt Academy. So I've been with Mr. Jin Lee for four years, um, with it, working with his family as well, and it's just been an awesome experience all around. Cool. So that's that's the where, and that that's some of the when. Let's talk about the why. The why. That's a very in-depth question. Um, for me, my entire life, I have always been involved in athletics, always interested in the action. But as you grow older, you suffer certain injuries, have certain commitments, and your age starts to catch up with you. I found that that play I fell in love with as a kid was lost to me as an adult. And I tried to find that in so many different ways by continuing the sports I played when I was younger. But that's discouraging because you can no longer play at the level you once played at. Given the injuries I had suffered, there's many things I couldn't do as well. The, the pounding of running or marathons and triathlons was no longer a possibility. So I, I searched and searched, and, and finally, I don't want to say I stumbled on, but I found Taekwondo. I found the martial arts. And something about the physical flow of it um, might sound surprising, but I was able to engage in that meaningful movement once again. I didn't have the, the aches and the pains for days afterwards. And maybe it's that circular motion. Maybe it's the ability to not engage in jumping techniques when, when you don't feel it that day, um, even though I do that more often than I probably should. But um, finding Taekwondo, finding the martial arts has given me that, that meaning again um, that I once had as a kid and, and I felt I lost. Let's unpack that meaning. 
you know, what did it mean to you as a child to participate in sports that you've, you've found it again now, obviously there's a physical component. I, I think that's pretty obvious, but talk about the, the other stuff, the mental or the emotional stuff and, and why that resonates for you. I think for, for myself and so many different athletes, they identify themselves as, as athletes. And it means so much that, that thrill of competition, pushing yourself to your limits, working with others who are going to help you push you to your limits. And that, that feeling of victory, that feeling when everything comes together and you make it happen just the way you want to, nothing can replace that. Now, as you grow older, it's, it's harder to find that feeling. Um, but I was able to find it once again in, in Taekwondo and, and it's such a valuable thing. And, and that competition just gets the competitive juices flowing. And as an athlete, and I'm, again, all other athletes feel this, once you lose that, a piece of you is missing. And Taekwondo has helped me find that again. Great. And of course, you're certainly not alone. You know, I'm sure there are a lot of listeners out there who really enjoy that sense of competition, even if it's not competition at an actual competition. Sometimes competition can be in the, the dojang. Uh, you know, the, the idea that you're, you're testing yourself maybe against the person lined up next to you, whether or not they realize you're doing that, whether or not they realize you're comparing that, that motivation can be really positive. Is that what, what you experience? Well, there is, that's the wonderful thing about it. There's forms, there's breaking, there's actual sparring. In sparring, you get that head-to-head -head competition, that, that mano y mano, one versus one, which is a great thing. But most oftentimes, the competition is with yourself. Can I make this stretch just a little bit further? Can I kick a fraction of an inch higher? How can I not perfect your form, but get that form as done as well as I possibly can? And, and it's this competition that happens day in, day out. And really appreciating just the minor improvements that you can make makes such a big difference for me. Well said. I think that gives us a pretty good place to move forward. We've got a sense as to who you are, where, when, why, you know, answer a bunch of those questions. Let's talk about stories. Obviously, you're a doctor, so there's some stories there. I don't know if this is going to weave in or not. Hopefully, we'll, we'll find more, find out more about your career as we move forward. But this whole show is framed around stories. And I'd like you to take a moment and tell us your best martial arts story. My best martial arts story probably isn't even my own story. I think I, I recently wrote a book and preparing that book, I, I talked to a lot of different people to try to get their perspectives, to try to get their stories. And these are the best martial arts stories that, that I know of. Um, in particular, again, there's so many, but one that really resonated with me and one that hit home with me, I think is a story of perseverance. It's uh, about a young man in his, in his high school years who started up in Taekwondo. He started with his brother. Um, his brother began initially and was interested in it, and he tagged along. Now, the young man I'm talking about has cerebral palsy. So he had no intention, no idea that he would ever be involved in Taekwondo. But when he came to watch his brother, Grandmaster Lee approached him and said, why aren't you out here? And he thought the, the answer was obvious. I have this physical impairment. Um, it's a permanent movement disorder that, that impairs him, especially in his legs. So it, it made no sense to him. But after a while, Grandmaster Lee convinced him to start training. And he talks about his growth. And it's not just the physical milestones that he reached. He spoke when before he started Taekwondo, he could only take 15 steps. And at, over that long period of time, through surgeries, through, through physical pain, through hours and hours of training, he was able to ultimately walk over 1,000 steps on his own. And there's that physical transformation. But he also talked about that mental and emotional transfer, transformation. He spoke of before he came to Taekwondo, he is already defeated. He accepted defeat in life and had no real motivation. But afterwards, his, his eyes were open to different things. And he says largely because of the people around him and the philosophy wrapped up in Taekwondo. No matter what you do, no matter what you have to offer, you do the best with what you have. And that's something that, that really resonated with him. 
and if we, we, we skip over a few years here and all his efforts, I was able to watch his, his black belt ceremony and to see him walk across the gym floor to accept his black belt was just a phenomenal thing. It was, I was a very small part of it, just a spectator in the crowd. But I think just about everyone there was on the verge of tears because that's what true perseverance is. A lot of us come to Taekwondo training and we get bruised up, we get injured, maybe some broken bones, maybe some torn ligaments, but that's a choice that we have. And we take that on. But this young man was, was forced to, he was thrust, thrust into this situation. And that's true perseverance. He made the most of it and, and he rose above it. It was just, just an amazing story. It's the stories like that, that, that really, you know, for me at least choke me up, you know, cause I, I've seen that stuff happen. I've seen people grow by such absolute leaps and bounds through martial arts to accomplish things that, you know, the modern world or, or traditional medicine may say, this will never happen. And yet we see it happen. And the longer you stay in the martial arts community, the more stories like this we hear. And, you know, there's, there's a, a magic, if you want to call it that somewhere in there. And, and I, I can't fully explain it and I'm not even going to try, but when I hear a story like that, there are two things that strike me. One is, is, just the sheer power of it, the the emotional component, and and knowing that because of his involvement in martial arts, this young man's life has changed forever. And then, secondly, not being terribly surprised because I've heard so many other stories like this. And what I love about this story is his life has been changed forever, but the people that he now empowers, the people that he now motivates, their lives are changed as well. And I, I think a big part of this has to do with the fact that the martial arts and my experience with Taekwondo, there's no other endeavor where mind, body, and spirit are, are linked so closely. And it can have such an, a profound impact when you touch on all three of those arenas. Mm. Very well said. Very well said. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And you mentioned a book, and I know we're going to talk more about that as we move forward. Other than martial arts, let's get to know you a little bit better outside of martial arts. What else are, are you passionate about? Do you have hobbies or, or other pursuits, physical or non, that really speak to you? My, my profession and my passion is sports psychology. So I spend a, a lot of time working with athletes um, to help them gain the competitive edge to become better athletes. And I think that's one of the reasons that the martial arts really speaks to me is because it's really the same thing. The entry point of influence is different. With martial arts, it's, it, you enter through the body. You influence mind and spirit through that physical motion. With sports psychology, I enter through the mind, and I influence the body and the spirit that way. That's my passion. Um, in terms of hobbies, it's kind of funny because I don't have any anymore. Um, being a sports psychologist with a growing profession keeps me very busy. I'm a husband and father of three kids. They also keep me very busy. I used to be involved in all kinds of things. As I mentioned before, marathons, triathlons, I was a private pilot. And initially, just like my dad used to take me up when I was a kid, but had to stop because he had four children, I ultimately had to stop flying because you just don't find the time anymore. So I don't really have many hobbies other than spending time with my kids, watching them now play sports. And I get out and I do Taekwondo whenever I can. Great. Great. So would you say that the, the your martial arts training now satisfies everything that you were doing before? Or were you searching in doing these other things and you found Taekwondo? I think I was searching. Okay. And I think I found Taekwondo and it now satisfies that that need, that urge. And, and I'd say one of the biggest differences with Taekwondo as opposed to those other things I was doing, this actually allows me time with my family because I don't have to do it separately. I don't have to isolate myself, train early in the morning or late at night when the kids are sleeping because you can't, you're doing these things by yourself. But with Taekwondo, you can train with them at the same time. And that's also a, a very rare thing. Does your family train with you? 
They do. Uh, my wife is now a high brown belt, and my three kids train as well, and they range in age from 11 down to 6, and two of them are brown belts, and, and the youngest is a high purple belt. So so we're all involved. Great. Did they follow you in, or did you follow them? I think I was the the impetus, the, the driving motivation, but I wanted to do it as a family. So we had that that conversation, you know, this is something we want to do. We want to do it until we, we get our black belts and they're very young at age and, and they agreed. And there are certainly times when they resist um, because it is hard work. It is a challenge, but I know in the end that it's going to be better for them as it has been much, much better for myself. Is, is the family atmosphere strong in the school you attend? Some schools, it's almost exclusively families. Others, it's Far less so. It's not exclusively families, but the family feel that you are given when you get there is just great. Uh, Mr. Jin Lee and his family run the school. He he and his wife and his two kids assist. So that that's a family teaching other families how to do it. And they they work so well together. They work so well with the children. And that family environment um, has made a huge difference for, for my family. Mm. I think there's there's something to be said for that culture, that that family vibe. Uh, there's one school local to me that I'm thinking of in particular, and it it seems like whenever I go visit, it's it's never one new person has started. It's this new family has started, and I think that that's a lot of fun for a lot of the reasons you've articulated. You know, about being able to be there together and do something, develop together, support each other. There, there's a lot of great benefits in there. And I think the people that we have connected with, they also have their, uh, their a husband and wife with their children. So it's very easy to connect with them too because they want something more in life and it happens to be the same thing that you want. Cool. I like that. Let's talk about the impact your martial arts training has had on your life. We, we all go through these challenging times. You know, it can be something really small, you know, it could be, I'm having a really bad day, or it could be something, you know, the complete opposite end of the spectrum. We've had guests on that have talked about the full range, you know, a absolute spectrum of negativity. I'd like you to take a moment, think about something that's happened with you and how your martial arts training has allowed you to progress forward. I think personally, in general, Training in the martial arts has just simply made me happier, healthier, and more complete. It's given me balance. As I, as I mentioned, that, that physical component to my life was missing for a long, long time. And, and finding that has really made a difference for me personally. From a professional standpoint, I think it's really assisted me in my sports psychology practice. Because what I do is if you look at big picture and little picture, in the little picture, I try to give the athletes I work with the mental skills that they will need in the moment to excel, to gain that competitive edge. And in the bigger picture, I wanted to help them develop a philosophy about sport and competition. And the martial arts, that philosophy is built in and it's been there for hundreds of years. And applying that to my practice has been really helpful for me, but I think it also helps my athletes. It gives them a, a unique way of thinking about sports and life. Right on. I like the way that you talk about balance. I think that's something that we don't do well with in American society and in certainly plenty of other places in the world. We tend to be singularly focused in of course, if you look at any of the graphics, the, the motivation that comes out of modern media it tends to be all about intensity and, and push and drive and beast mode and, and all these other things. And the older I get, the more I found balance to be a more motivating force than myopic focus. And it, it sounds like you might be suggesting the same. Absolutely. You'll talk about different exercise programs, get in shape in 15 minutes a day. And to me, that there, there's no balance there. And it's kind of those extremes. Well, I'm going to spend as little time as I possibly can doing this so that it's going to benefit me in another area of life. But with, with the martial arts, 
It's about applying it to every area of your life, not just when you're at training, but when you leave the dojang as well. And I think that that philosophical side of it really brings the balance to the activity. There are certainly the physical benefits. You become stronger, faster, greater balance, greater flexibility. But it's the philosophical side that, that advances your way of thinking that really impacts you. And I think that's something that can be helpful to, to someone in our society, especially. Definitely. If I were to ask you who's been the most influential person on your training, and I was to pull out your main instructor there, because that, that's the one everybody tends to go towards. If who's, I can't... Yeah, who, who's that person? If I can't mention my instructor and his family... Um, I think I naturally go to my classmates. Being there day in, day out for – I've been training for over four years, almost five years now. And it's these same people that come with the right attitude. We all have problems. We all have setbacks in our regular life. But when they show up at the dojang, they're there. They're there to work hard. They're, they're focused and they're always positive and adaptive. And I think – about my upbringing in the martial arts, the people that I've stood with the most, um, I hope they don't mind, but I'm going to mention a couple names. It, it's the Seifert family, Mr. Chris Seifert, who's a few months ahead of me in his training, who's always standing ahead of me. Mrs. Seifert, Mrs. Rosa Seifert, who's directly to my left. She's been standing there for three plus years now. and we, we train side by side almost every time we're there. Mr. Bowie, another gentleman, um, who's a few months ahead of me, someone that, that I appreciate training with because they always come with the right attitude. It's, it really makes the difference, doesn't it? When you have people engaged in the same practice, working towards similar goals with a similar level of passion, you've probably had classes where you found yourself either the one who was the most motivated or, or, or maybe, you know, kind of dragon butt a little bit. I certainly have. And everybody else is, is not there with you. And it can be tiring. I, I personally, and, and I don't know about you, take a lot of energy from my classmates. If, if they're on fire, if they're charged up, you know what? I'm going to have a much better class. I'm feeding off what they're contributing to the room. Exactly. And we, we benefit from that and we depend on each other for that. In particular, for me, it's Friday nights. Every Friday night class, I, I show up and it's been a long work week. Um, you're looking forward to the weekend where you can have a little bit of time off. But that, that Friday night class, before you get there, it's sometimes difficult to, to be emotionally ready for that, to be motivated. But the other students, the, the people you stand side by side with, help you get through that. And it's usually the stretch period, that 15-minute period where I slowly get myself ready You'll interact with the other students a little bit, uh, which is always helpful. And then by the time that stretch period is over, it, it makes a big, big difference. And Friday nights lately has been working with Mr. Sam Ekoff, another gentleman who has influenced me, not during my color belt training, but since I've been a black belt, who's been very, very helpful as well. And I would say someone who has been very important to my training. In what way? Tell us about him. Well, he started off, of course, as we all do, as, as a student, and I was not familiar with him until he became um, came to our school, and he was already a black belt. But um, he's so dedicated, he is so committed to it that he has started to become an instructor, so he started to teach classes as well. But just working side by side with him, again, always the right attitude, always very courteous, always willing to go out of his way, as, as, Ms., as the Seiferts are, as Mr. Bowie is. And when you see that and you come to class, whatever difficulties you have, you, you just drop them because you know that, that you're not there just for yourself. You're there to, to assist other people in finding whatever they're looking for. In my case, balance. In other people's cases, it might be something else. But to assist them to reach their goals is – to be a small part of that is, is very important. Hmm. And that's an attitude I expect you take into your professional life too. I do. But I think that Taekwondo, again, in giving me this, this comprehensive philosophy and approach has helped me become better at that. 
with what you know now, what would you have done differently as it affects your profession? Would you have maintained any, would you have maintained your athletic pursuits? Uh, would you have found martial arts earlier or are you better because you had that absence of training that now you've reintegrated? That's an interesting question. I, I think when it's all said and done, I think going through that struggle, that period of searching has probably made me appreciate it more. But if I could have found it 35 years ago, I think I would have. I don't, I don't think I would second guess that. Mm. And the, the interesting thing is I, I grew up in a town called Brookfield and J.K. Lee Black Belt Academy was just a few miles away. I didn't even know it was there. And this is not the age of social media where you can find things so easily. But it was a little bit off the beaten path and I had no idea. How did you find this school? Was, was it through research or? I went through a couple different schools. I visited them. And a gentleman that I worked with, um, Dr. Edmundo Centena, um, who's a psychiatrist, suggested J.K. Lee Black Belt Academy to me. I told him that I was interested in something for myself and something for my family. And I think he heard the word family, and that's when he suggested it. And that has been such an important thing because the other schools I visited were very good. But when I went – when I walked through the doors at J.K. Lee Black Bell Academy, it, I could just feel it. It just made a difference, and I knew that, that we were in the right place. That's great. You've mentioned quite a few people by name. You know, Clearly, these are people that are important to you, and it's important. I mean it, it really makes the difference. Anybody out there listening knows what it's like to train at a school where maybe you don't click personally or socially, and you certainly have that. If there was somebody you could train with that you haven't, you know, from, from anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, any martial art, who would you want to work with? I think I would have to travel back in time uh, over a thousand years and train with the Harang Warriors. And I'm not even sure if I'm saying that correctly, but this was a, a group of men that they were warriors in Korea and they helped unify that Korean peninsula. And the, the interesting thing about them was that they weren't just trained in the art of war, how to fight, but they're also trained in, in philosophy and poetry and, and song. And this to me is what I'm trying to communicate to the people that I work with today. They were complete in character. They weren't one dimensional. They had so much to offer beyond their physical capabilities beyond their fighting skills. And I think to, to survive and to thrive into today's society, we have to be complete in character. And that's difficult, especially for athletes, because they're, they're encouraged to specialize, to do just one sport at a younger age and leave everything else by the wayside. And granted, you're going to have to put in a lot of time to excel at whatever sport you choose but you can't do that to the neglect of everything else around you. You have to take in these other areas of life to be a complete to be a complete person and weather the storm of athletics, whether you're you're winning or you're losing, succeeding or failing. So I think to be a part of that for a short period of time, to see what that looks like would be very interesting. We've talked today about competition and, and being an athlete. What does competition, as it relates to Taekwondo, mean for you? Do you enter tournaments, or is your sense of competition within the dojo? It's both. On a day-to-day -day basis, you are literally working on a certain skill to improve, not just because it's the right thing to do and it feels good, but to get ready for tournaments. One of the kicks that, that I've been working on since I started – this is the roundhouse kick, and you develop it, and it turns into the, this, the jump round, the reverse round. And now I'm working on the 540, which I may never reach, but it's just the most minute details. And you get a new insight. You get a new physical feel for it, and it's just so rewarding. And it might be years before I get there, and especially since it's a jumping kick, and I'm 
40 plus, the knees, the knees feel it pretty quickly. So every time I train in, I can only do it four or five times. Mm. And to see how even that can make a difference. So it's that day-to-day competition that gets you ready for, for tournaments. And yes, we, we do compete in tournaments at our school, and it's a very, very rewarding experience. What do you enjoy about tournaments? Well, the funny thing is when I got into Taekwondo, I thought it would be sparring. And I thought all, all, that's all there was. I had no idea that there was forms and there was breaking that really didn't register with me. But one of the, the things I really like is breaking. I've come to enjoy forms much more than I ever thought I would. Um, so I really look forward to breaking at tournaments. Do you have a, a particular break that you're working on now? I'm, yeah, I'm always working on them. I'm always trying to get them better. Um, one of the, the stories that come to mind was when I did my first tournament as a black belt. You know you're going to have to step it up because you're you're competing against other black belts and maybe other black belts that are far advanced compared to you or have been doing it for a much longer time. So I, I knew I had to really push the limits. And there were five kicks in this tournament. So I chose two blindfolded kicks. Um, low back swing, and then a back swing about head level. Then I continued to the double front snap kick, and my final kick was the reverse round suspended, which I'm sure you know means there's an emphasis on precision and speed as opposed to power. And the interesting thing about this tournament was the way I progressed through the five kicks. Though I had that blindfold on for the first two kicks, I could feel the crowd's, eye, the crowd's eyes on me. I was still very self-conscious and I, I, I broke, but I didn't do it convincingly. So I take the blindfold off and I go to the, the double front snap kick and the eyes disappear. Things start to melt away and my focus starts to sharpen and I'm really starting to get in the moment. And I completed those kicks convincingly and they felt great. So I finally move on to the reverse round suspended break. And at that point, I finally achieved just supreme confidence. There's no doubt in my mind that I'm going to break. My body feels relaxed. My mind feels confident. And you just know it's going to happen. And for me, that's one of those feelings I was missing. And you might refer to it as being in the zone, um, but it's those moments where you achieve your best, your personal best. And that one stands out for me. And that's, I think, for that few seconds, which seemed for for a very long period of time, it seemed like it's forever. But I think I was able to engage the indomitable spirit then and there. And that's why people do it. It's such a great feeling. What elements from your professional life have you been able to take into competition that our listeners might, might appreciate? Well, and that's when we talk about the in the moment perspective and I think one of the things that I'm able to take into competition is this idea of something being a challenge instead of a threat. When you approach the world or you approach, let's just specifically talk about maybe sparring. If you see that as a threat, a way that you can be harmed, a way that you can be hurt, embarrassed, look bad, you're going to hold back. You're not going to be able to really tap into all of your abilities. And if you think about someone who's facing a threat, maybe in a movie, they're cowering in the corner, laying in a fetal position, their eyes are shut, they're tense, they're, they're physically fatigued. And if you see situations or define situations as threatening, that's the response you get. The body will not respond to the mind the way it can. And the mind isn't sending the right messages. So if you're able to turn that situation around into a challenge, Something where you are out to get it. You're able to earn something. You're going to strive hard for it. And when you're able to see things that way, you, you extend your limits. There is no threat. There is only gain. And when you do that, you're able to much reach much higher heights. And it's the specific skills, the mindset that allows you to define things as a challenge versus a threat. Movies. Let's talk about movies, and then we're going to talk about books. We'll talk about your book and, and some of the things you have going on personally. But here's another opportunity for us to get to know you as, as a person. 
who enjoys martial arts. Do you have any favorite martial arts movies? I do. And I'm afraid it's not going to be very original. You probably already know what I'm going to say. But for me, I was a teenager when it came out. It's the Karate Kid. <laughs> Just like I'm sure so many kids in the United States feel the same way. But I remember seeing that movie and, and just thinking, you know, it was a great movie, great message. I can remember leaving the theater and and mock sparring with my friends. Um, yeah, that was just probably my favorite movie. More recent movie that I really enjoyed was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Is that the title? Yeah. Yes. I, I really like that one, too. No, you're, you're hitting my two favorites. <laughs> you, you will... No one will ever fault you for mentioning the Karate Kid on this show. That's for I sure. appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> How about actors? Is there anybody that, you know, when they pop up in a movie, you say, you know, oh, that's one I want to see? I don't know if I have any favorite actors. I, I do appreciate the martial arts movies. I watched Kung Fu as a, as, a, as a teenager as well. Always liked watching that. I think it's the – the movies themselves, the physical action that make a big difference. I think if I talk about my favorite martial artists, it's probably my kids. Mm. Um, it might sound cheesy, but just oh, watching wow. them grow, watching them flourish is, is such a, such a special thing. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, nothing cheesy about that at all. <laughs> Let's talk about books. Let's talk about books that aren't yours first. And then we can talk about yours and, and some of the other things going on with you. Sure. Are there martial arts related books that you've found that you really enjoy that our listeners might appreciate a recommendation on? I think so. I think that the books, there are to me two types of books with, with respect to the martial arts. There are those that focus on technique and focus on the actual physical art of Taekwondo. And those are very, very helpful. But I think the books that really appeal to me are the ones that talk about the philosophy of Taekwondo. And one of those books, and it helped me in writing my own book, was by Doug Cook. It's called Taekwondo, A Path to Excellence. Mm -hmm. And he really taps into the philosophy of it and, and why it's so important. And that's what I appreciate about that book. He's a very well-known martial arts writer. And, and the, yeah, this was a really good book. Yeah kind of opens your mind to the things you, you might be missing. Great recommendation. Let's talk about your book. You've mentioned it a couple times, so here's a good spot. Tell us, tell us about your book. Why did you write a book? What's it about? My book is called Master Mental Toughness, Insights into Peak Performance Through Modern Day Science and the Ancient Martial Arts. And I think I, I wrote it, one for myself, just because the way it benefited me, again, we talk about this, the philosophy, this philosophy of action. And it, 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 honestly, it started out as my black belt project. I should probably say that. We're expected to complete a black belt project before you can get your black belt. And it started off with a four to five page essay. And the thoughts just started to flow and I, I couldn't stop and it just kept going and it finally turned into like a 150 page book. But again, it's about this philosophy of action and how it applies not to everyone, but specifically to athletes. And there was such a benefit, I think, for them when we talk about a psychological profile of peak performance, the philosophy of action that Taekwondo has, it's, it's all right there. And it's been there for thousands of years. It's courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, indomitable spirit. And what I try to do in the book is break those down so that they're not such vague, nebulous terms. To really break it down so that people can recognize it and use it on a daily basis. So that it not only makes a difference in life, but it helps them gain a competitive edge and excel in athletics as well. And this started as a, a project for your black belt. This sounds, yes. Is everyone's black belt project this big of an undertaking or did you kind of go off the rails on your own direction? I think I went off the rails a bit. Um, black belt projects are typically meant to benefit the community in some way. People will engage in, in charity work, something that's meaningful to them. 
Um, and it, it, they can make a big, big difference with respect to whatever cause they have. But uh, again, I think my essay itself turned into my Black Belt project. And I, yeah, you're right. I went off the rails with it. That's for sure. Well, it, it sounds like it's something by all means that, that needed to exist. So thank you for, for writing it. And I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you. What's keeping you going? I'm sure you have goals. You know, I don't, I don't know. Is that, is that future rank or, or something with your kids? Like what's, what's motivating you? Well, I'm, I'm, I have my first degree. I continue to train and, and work towards my second degree black belt. And I think it's the balance that I found that, that piece that was missing that is now there. I get to engage in it every day. Um, it takes you beyond a typical experience. And, and I think that's what I'm looking for. And I think that's what so many people in the martial arts are looking for. And to engage in that and get that feeling day in, day out makes such a big, big difference. For me, the the mindless physical activity of pumping iron or walking on a treadmill just couldn't do it. It just wasn't there. But there's so much thought. There's so much strategy. And there's a reason for every single thing you do in Taekwondo. And wrapping my head around that, that's the true challenge. And that's what I really enjoy. If people want to get a hold of you, if they want to find your book, or, you know, I'm assuming you're online and various places. How can people find you and what you've written? Well, they can find the book on on Amazon. Um, just type in my name and, and it should come up. And that's Master Mental Toughness. I've also started a, a podcast myself recently, which has a a sports psychology focus, but we definitely delve into the martial arts and and what that has to offer as well. That can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. And that podcast is called Ignite Your Life. Great. And of course, folks, we'll have all of this stuff linked and referenced over on the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you happen to be driving or walking or just in some other way, it's not convenient for you to write that stuff down. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you being on the show today. Thanks for, for sharing and for being so open with with you and your family and your whole journey. Any parting words that you'd like to leave the audience with today? Yeah, I think I can think of a couple words I, I can leave with the audience. And I think they would be directed at, at color belts and people who are considering the martial arts, but haven't quite yet made that leap. It's a, it's a long process. It's a challenge. You're going to have to work hard. And you have to overcome these physical barriers, these physical obstacles that we that each of us has. But you got to work through that first barrier. And if you're able to do that and the longer you stay engaged, that's when the philosophy really starts to impact you. And I think that's where the real difference is made. Because when you forward your thinking in that manner, again, it becomes part of your life, it becomes becomes a way that you see the world and a way to make it better. And I think that's where the true change is. So in, in, endure and engage in the physical process as, as long as you can. And then ultimately that philosophy will hit you. And when it does, it makes all the difference. If you haven't noticed by now, I love getting into the mental aspects of martial arts, which is just one of the reasons I enjoy today's episode. Dr. Peering got my wheels turning on a few things, and I bet he did for you too. Thank you, Dr. Peering, for coming on the show today. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes with photos, the title of his book, and all the other great stuff we put over there. If you're interested in his podcast, you can find that over there as well. You can find us on social media, at Whistlekick on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, um, some other social media sites nobody uses anymore. <laughs> the point is, if you're on social media, look for us. We're there, posting the best stuff that we can, usually a couple times a day. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. Pick up some new shin guards today at whistlekick.com, or you can just wait till the next time, you know, you're limping around. Either way, your choice. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.